was looking at this uh, differential transcript expression uh, methods lately, mainly because I noticed in all the scripts when I joined Liber, uh, the the for we do usually this well, this uh, analysis we we do all four uh, genomic features uh, exons junctions um, transcript and genes and looking at the code I noticed that uh, for uh, for transcript there was a it was the only exception the way uh, Lima was run it wasn't using Zoom. And that made me look into what are the actual, uh, uh, you know, current practices out there for current uh, methods for for running differential expression at transcript level, which is its own uh, thing because of the the methods being slightly different to get the transcript quantification going. So, um, just to remind, uh, let me see. Just to remind, the the focus here is in differential transcript expression, and even though the paper that I I uh, used for this uh, the benchmark paper that I used for this presentation is based on uh, is focused mostly on differential transcript usage. Uh, my interest is it was mostly in different transcript uh, differential transcript expression, and it's it in order to you know yeah, just a simple reminder. Uh, for what that what these two how these two are different the differential transcript usage refers refers to as basically isoform fraction changes within uh, each gene while um, differential transcript expression dte looks just like uh, for genes we do it but uh, independent transcript expression changes across the whole transcriptome so it doesn't care about the fraction within each gene it just consider each transcript independently each exp its expression and DTU as are uh, DTE and DTU are usually going together in in multi isoform genes of course because there is no DTU in single uh, transcript genes um and but usually when you have in uh, multi isoform genes when you have a transcript with significant DTU usually it's also referred to as an isoform switch sometimes it doesn't have to be uh, between two conditions. You also notice probably a significant DTE for them because, like, as you can see, and uh, in this uh, simpler presentation here, you base it's good to look at the transcript level because sometimes DG uh, this differential expression at gene level may not see uh, may not detect changes between two conditions, but if you go to the isoform level, you can see quite big changes, even the overall sum of transcript expression is the gene expression, right? Um, and you cannot detect important, possibly causal changes in the isoform expression. So yeah, to read, just to read that DT is just differential expression at transcript level, like instead of doing it at gene level. And but the interesting part is the authors of most uh, differential expression workflows uh, insist on on using the raw counts for uh, differential expression analysis, and uh, I think they they are preferred mostly because the normalization, if you use a normalized data, that discards the library size info, right? It it uh, normalization smooths the uh, it brings the counts um, the uh, the in a, in a specific way that you might lose the library size information. Um, and um, actually the most uh, used norm uh, normalization method for, for uh, transcripts, uh, transcript expression is TPM, transcripts per million basis. And then normalization method like other, like FPKM, RPKM, uh, they, they, they take into account transcript length uh, during the nor normalization. And the fun fact about the TPMs actually, uh, uh, the average TPM across all transcripts in a sample is actually a constant. It's a 10 to the power of six divided by the number of transcripts. So the, the problem uh, that we had here uh, for a while and uh, is that when we collected the quantification data from various uh, programs, uh, various feature levels, um, we didn't have uh, the counts. I guess uh, 
the idea was that we the output of Salmon or Callisto that are programs that do trans specifically transcript quantification, they output a table with um, let's see later I think it might be the uh, uh, later uh, a table that has a lot of information that TPMs are already there. So I guess the impulse was for many uh, workflows to just use directly the normalized data uh, TPMs there and ignore the counts. Because TPMs and normalized data is used in many analyses, but apparently there was a discussion. Uh, there are many discussions on online about yeah people doing this, grabbing the TPMs from the someone output files, but not getting the counts data, which is in the same file actually. But uh, so and then when you try to apply it in the last uh, several years proper differential expression. There was this question coming up that, yeah, that's uh, how do we do it properly? Because all the methods uh, that we know for differential expression starts with counts, not with normalized data. So this was questions popping up here. Uh, yeah, thank you to Hedia for putting this fun uh, uh, slide together. I don't know why she found that photo of me there, but uh, yeah, that's. So uh, yeah, this question was uh, on bioconductor support forum was popping up quite a bit. And there were some harsh expert opinions from the author of uh, Lima package that is we also use intensively here, um, Gordon Smythe, um, who had some harsh things to say about using TPMs. <laughs> but well, maybe he's bi biased a bit by the, the fact that, yeah, the Lima pipeline suggests using count so you can do, you can run, you know, Zoom properly to, to normalize and to to take into account library sizes and stuff. So uh, this passage, is uh, this post it was hard to read, but uh, it was useful to learn about other options there. And they do, he does suggest they're using something called Lima Trend. Um, I mean, it's a mon basically using a few parameters when you use as input the uh, log of TPM instead of original counts. So you cannot, runs boom i'm going to show later exactly the the steps but the idea is that there is some this kind of workaround to use trend but as we will see in our um, in the benchmarks uh, this using trend uh, doesn't change much from when you have only tpms as the input doesn't change much the outcome i mean now the summon data that I was saying earlier the, the output of summon is just really a simple file with the uh, well, among many other files, but the main one with the quantification data, it says these five uh, columns um, and TPM is one of them and counts are actually next to right the last column is num reads is actually the counts. And it's interesting to notice that, yeah, they are fractional counts. That's also different from all the other quantification methods using expecting integer counts. Um, like for genes, uh, junctions, uh, and um, axons, you usually have just how many reads span that feature. Um, but uh, for uh, the way the transcript, uh, transcript quantification works is really an estimate. It's based on estimating where a read come, can come from when, it's, because it's really difficult to do that in, in, in case of uh, overlapping isoforms, which share may share most of their axons. A read can be, uh, and it's uh, hard to place it, it, basically impossible to place it unambiguously on one of uh, one on a specific um, isoform if they share so much uh, exon uh, span between them. So that's why these they are estimates. And um, the main method that's recommended out there to import this data properly, you, so you get the TPMs and the counts is using uh, the TX import package, um, which has this TX import method uh, that has multiple options uh, to even scale the, the counts based on the length of the um, transcript. And there are other things to, to note here that uh, you have the actual, uh, the, you know, the uh, canonical length, which is based on sum of exon spans for each transcript, but um, there is also, so the it was called effective length, which is um, basically based on 
this is actually very strange here. <laughs> Let's see for this 200, <laughs> for this one. Effective length is the length that was uh, covered by by most reads, I think, in each sample. And it can vary from sample to sample, uh, which is interesting, uh, the interesting data point that should be considered in this anal analysis, I guess. So because yeah, when you just, uh, yeah? just, just as a caveat uh, or a, a, a an enlightenment, the 200 is normally based off of um, the uh, primer, the read primers. So that your effective length technically can't be negative. So normally what you go in, if anything is negative, you then replace it with the read length. Uh, uh, so that that's why you have the exactly 200. It's probably because when you were calculating the effective length, it went negative. Uh, oh, so this is like a fragment size? What are you saying about the 200? Where is it coming from? It's normally coming from the like your library prep for when you did the RNA sequencing. So normally, if it's this like a base, if this is a t paired in, and each of the uh the the things were like a hundred base pairs, then that yes. would make sense for two hundred. So like right, theoretic like fragment length. Size. I see. Yeah. yeah, interesting. I guess, but I never saw a negative in these tables, right? So I guess you're saying that if they... it can't be negative, uh -huh. so that's okay. why, like, if when you calculate it yourself, because because of the issues you guys are talking about, we had to calculate uh, TPM for other stuff and then count for other stuff. So we have scripts for count and cal calculating effective length. And in it is is theoretically, you're doing some subtraction and uh, from the mean uh, fragment length that you can get from the, the raw data, sometimes it does turn out to be negative, but that's impossible. So what you end up doing is fixing it. Uh, based off of the the minimum fragment length that it should be. Right. Actually, here I see that these are zero length. So I guess this is like a, when you don't have anything mapped to, you put the, basically the fragment length here. That's maybe it. Because it's zero TPM, zero number of reads in this table here, <laughs> this sample. Yeah. I'll, okay. I'll look for my, my, uh, my, my uh, code for this, and then I can probably help uh, explain it later. Yeah, but this is, uh, again, what I see here, that these basically these entries are going to be not used at all because they have zero um, TPM and numbering. So I understand, yeah, that's, that's like a placeholder there. They put fragment size when there is zero coverage. Okay. Uh, there isn't, uh, in some cases, where for TX import, you get this. Uh, so actually, the TXI object is interesting, uh, the result of this function. It has this... Uh, four in this example here, four overlaid uh, matrices of the same shape. Um, abundance is actually a TPM column here. Counts is uh, the num reads column. Uh, length is the effective length. Uh, and the variance here is only available when you run uh, someone or Callisto with uh, bootstrapping or inferential sample sampling. So, you have uh, this is more like an optional thing, but it it can be used for statistical estimation of the dispersion in some methods. And the new edge R paper I think uses uh, methods. They they use it quite a bit. And there are other methods making use of this variance estimation. Uh, counts from abundance is just a character saying that that it, how this import was done because there are multiple ways of importing this data. And one of them is this length scale TPM that seems to be in, in, or the recommended way to import these counts, which is basically you don't get in the TXI object, the counts matrix is actually a scaled version of what you see in the number it's column. Um, you can get the raw uh, one, but, um, and you can also convert with another function from TX import package, the num reads, uh, if you just import this length TPM and num reads, uh, sorry, effective length TPM and RAM reads uh, in, in like, let's say, in an RSC, just the raw counts, uh, you can still apply a function to convert this, uh, to get the length scale TPM, uh, which is an, an optional transformation for the Lima Room uh, approach that we'll see is recommended. Um, so that would be the basic DT approach when we, that we're also using here, Liber, uh, and many other for TPM only data, if you don't have the counts, you just have this uh, very simple uh, approach. You use essentially just uh, LM fit on the uh, log two of uh, 
of the TPM um, assay with a pseudo constant there. Um, just uh, yeah, use one or zero point five or something, and uh, and the design uh, matrix there. Um, and this is like the yeah when you see in this uh, like that these the recommended uh, three steps there right the LM fit to for to fit the linear model and compute the coefficients and residual variances and standard error and e, e Bayes to compute moderated t statistics and f statistics and log odds of differential expression by empirical Bayes moderation. Uh, and the uh, top table to extract uh, this table of the top ranked transcripts uh, from a fit linear model and the statistics. And this is like the recipe that we're following at uh, transcript level. So you see, this is the somewhat compromise here. We're skipping the room step, uh, as we'll see later. That's by just using this uh, log transformation of the TPM values. Now, the Lima trend approach that Gordon Smythe was uh, suggesting as a possible workaround uh, is slightly, it just adds a slim, simple change here. You, you use E Bayes with this parameter trend equal true, but, uh, and also compute the array weights with this array weights function, which uh, I'm not sure exactly what it does. I think it might be taking into account the library side, but I'm not sure. Um, I didn't look because basically uh, we ha we haven't been using that actually in most of the what I noticed internally. This was, and I, as we'll see, it's not a really doesn't make a big difference if you run it with array weights and trend uh, or without, like with a simple one that we saw earlier. <clears throat> now the recommended Lima Vum approach that we actually applied to to the gene level also and. Um, and the other features, right? Because we had the original counts, is uh, is this is a bit more involved, and and it's supposed to. It actually expects uh, it it like as opposed to the previous uh, TPM approach, we shouldn't pre-filter the data. I mean, we could, but uh, they have this their own suggestion here in the in the recommendations that I saw is to use this filter by expression method from HR, um, and to even this is an interesting note here. Uh, you'll see later that you can specify when you filter by expression, you can actually specify the design matrix. And the model that I didn't show here is the same like the one used earlier, right? Basically you build the model matrix before and then, yeah, you uh, you use it for the filter by expression. So it makes the filtering design a group aware, right? Um, and you'll see that actually it's important but it might be also a bit of a, I don't know, I want to point this out later. Uh, but the change here, in, in that the important change is here that you use this calc norm factors to, to compute the scaling factors mostly. Uh, and Ru and VOOM actually is the, the method that's uh, the, the power one that transforms the count data to log two counts per million and uh, estimates the mean variance relationship and computes the appropriate observation level weights. Um, and only with this, after this room transformation, you you, you use LM fit and eBay as and top table. The last three steps are the same. But you see the starting is the, with the scale counts that I showed earlier that, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, you can import the raw counts. They are not really quite raw. They are actually slightly apply this transformation here that it's, su it's suggested by the by the TX import authors and the um, latest pip pipelines that I saw, workflows that I saw is to use length scale TPM here instead of just importing raw counts. I I... I sh I guess yeah I could have tried to benchmark them uh, myself but uh, yeah I only since this is like recommendation to still use the length scale TPMs I counts I mean uh, if I I use that um, generally for for my um, differential differential classic expression uh, calculations now this is a bit confusing the parameter I I also found this uh, like length scale TPM 
it's uh, for me it suggests like it's scaling TPMs, but actually after doing this, and if you use TX imported this parameter, TPMs are not scaled at all, but the counts are actually scaled. But I guess I suppose it's a way of saying that uh, they are using length and the TPMs to scale the counts or something, because the par the parameter name is actually counts from abundance. So it's using TPMs and the effective length. They are re they are scaling the counts a bit. Um, so this would be the approach that we haven't been using, but um, I yeah, I started using it lately, and now that Speakeasy adds this uh, counts map uh, for a while now, I think from last year or two years ago, the counts array uh, matrix is there in the RSC that we're using. I think we should add the length, <laughs> though the length array, but uh, for now at least we have what is called the counts, the raw counts that we can use for, for this uh, differential transcript expression methods. And uh, now the paper that I was looking is from 2018, is not that uh, recent, but it was the it was an easy way to to run uh, some benchmark on a simulated data set, which supposedly had the you know the ground truth is known. So these are with all the caveats for simulation simulated data, we still have something to play with, right? So it was a relatively small data set with 12 versus 12 samples. Um, so two conditions, 24 samples total. And uh, they simulated fast Q reads from a bunch of transcripts uh, uh, that they wanted to consider to be differentially expressed. Um, and um, yeah, this was quantified versus GenCode 28. So I built the RSC from this based on their, uh, they only provide a TXI object, the, the TX import object. But it's easy to build a, if you have the gen code annotation to build the RS, full RSC. And then uh, run, they ran a lot of uh, like seven tools here, I think. Uh, oh, there are four, actually, there are four on this one. They sleuth, the last one is, is not using all the benchmarks. Uh, but I, as I said, I've, even though the paper is mostly about referential transcript usage, which was a interesting, a new thing, I guess, at the time to to play around. Uh, I, my, my focus is on DTE because I really, again, DTE is uh, just looking a relative uh, a relative uh, expression of transcript size of form uh, fractions, while uh, DTE is still interesting to see, you know, to, to, go, to see if uh, in, across the whole transcript tome between two conditions, you have some significant changes in a, in a transcript expression. I think it's the, it's a more like all encompassing uh, way of looking at the differential transcript expression, right? Um, so uh, that DTE in their paper is more like a side thing. I didn't see uh, the focus was, as I said, on mostly on DTU, but I, so I only grabbed the DTE code from, from there uh, for this particular uh, example here. So, and unfortunately, just because uh, somehow DTU was their focus, the DTE, um, the plots they provided are kind of like this blurry one was in the paper because it was not the main, uh, as I said, the focus on the on the paper. So um, and this is the best I could get from there in terms of the DTE plot. And they use this uh, iCobra package, which is apparently a paper from Nature Methods from 2006. They su su uh, proposed this method to, to benchmark when you have the ground truth is known, right? You have the true positives. Uh, you can make these nice plots um, just to compare a various method. In this case, so this, uh, in, so this each point in this plot represents one method and one cutoff. Um, and the points corresponding to the same method are joined together by a line, as you can see, right? By uh, But if a method controls the FDR, which means uh, if the observed FDR is lower than or equal to the imposed cutoff, the corresponding point is filled instead of the uh, empty circle. So the things with the filled circles are uh, supposedly you know uh, better performing. So they they use these methods and the lima option that they use in the code is actually the lima vuma I described earlier with one small difference that I'll point out uh, later, but. Um, 
as you see, uh, well, this is a small data set, and I saw the um, uh, paper suggesting that uh, as you increase the number of samples, uh, this that uh, on the TPR, uh, uh, this TPR is sorry, the transcript um, as true positive rate, and FDR is false discovery rate. So these graphs, is, this plot is really about TPR versus a FDR. Um, as I was saying that uh, if you increase the number of samples, uh, this uh, the the power of uh, discovery in uh, edge edge R and you see the little clump here that edge R lima and um, edge R QL uh, method uh, they are they are gonna be get closer to D seq to D E seq two which is considered to be like um, I think um, a standard in the and very accurate in terms of uh, dif uh, differential expression through positive rate. Uh, and the, I never really used or heard of about EBSEC before. I, I, EBSEC, I don't know if it's uh, widely used. Um, I knew about you know DC2, but DC2 was not never a real choice for us at, uh, in our, with our data because we have hundreds of samples. And the seq two performance is really, yeah, it's slow for our the very large number of samples. While Lima, that's why I think it was another thing. It was a dot Lima uh, and Edgar are quite performant, so they scale up very well. Um, and again, I from what I'm reading, but I didn't see a lot of studies, uh, so I have to confirm this. But these are getting got closer together in terms of. Uh, sensitivity as the number of samples increase, which is normal, yeah, statistic, increased statistical power. Um, now, it's easy to modify this code. It's uh, to add our own benchmarking um, functions. So in this case, I just took out some of the methods that I really didn't know much about, uh, but I still have de seq 2 And basically I was able to add our uh, a few functions there. Like Lima log TPM is the the way we have been doing it when we only had the TPMs, the very simple one with like three lines or um, just uh, yeah the simplest approach when we have only TPMs. Lima trend was the one uh, yeah with the uh, array weights and using trend equal true and Lima Vum. Uh, Lima Vum is actually the the one that they used already in their package. Uh, uh, implementation so it's the same one that they had already the function in for I just renamed it here to distinguish from Lima Vum F and that's a um, funny little trick that uh, I'll I'll explain later but uh, that's a like, variant of Lima Vum variant is maybe too much to say but you will see that <laughs> interesting that little variant uh, Lima Vum F actually is getting closer to D seq two D seq two which is uh, Surprising, but uh, I have some problems with the way this is happening. We, well, it's interesting to discuss later. But uh, the Lima log, while well, Lima log and Lima trend, uh, they are using the log again, log TPM based, both of them. So they don't use uh, Vum, uh, the Vum method. And they look more like a sleuth uh, is here. So with the um, low, yeah, with the FDR, which is all over the place, and uh, and TPR. Well, the TPR is probably okay there somewhat, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It seems that it's I, it's hard for me to to, un to interpret properly this plot. Well, I was hoping yeah to get uh, to look at some variants of these methods that are getting closer to the seq two uh, accuracy. Overall, we can tell that the accuracy is quite a TPR is to be you know up to zero point five, so only fifty percent. Uh, that's because they simulated the fast Q reads and they actually did the mapping. So uh, of course, it's not a simple problem. So I guess a lot of this is lost in mapping, even with perfect. So fifty percent rate, uh, it's interesting. That's that's what we can do with someone when we have overlapping isoforms. I suppose <laughs> it's a hard problem. Um, now the uh, Lima Vum F that I showed earlier that seems to have an interestingly high performance differs very little by from Lima Vum. 
uh, implemented already in their code day. Uh, and the difference is the difference is just adding design to uh, I left this in here. I should have removed it. But I think there's just the design of the model matrix to the to the filter by expression. Uh, please ignore this at the bottom here. I was I meant to delete it. <laughs> Uh, but basically, there a small difference. I think I didn't expect this to make such a. I mean, now that I think of it, this trick just uh, uh, adding the making the filter by expression aware of the groups. Uh, it means if I look at the function description that it takes into account right the grouping of the samples and the specific characteristics of expression in the two groups. So applies essentially slightly different filtering for the two groups. I notice that filter by expression apply this way um, results in more uh, more entries, uh, more more trans, not more features, more transcript being um, so is is more permissive. More features are being uh, going into the next steps, right? The filter uh, filter here is uh, is allowing more more transcripts to go through. Um, the problem is. This sounds to me, I mean, I don't know, it's a prop discussion. It seems like, uh, and maybe DEC2 is doing that too, because it uses the design matrix from the first uh, the, the initial steps there. So it looks like it may leave more more transcripts from from the from the one of the conditions may go through, right? Which may introduce in, I don't know, that's a discussion maybe, maybe asking your opinion here. Uh, may introduce a little bias, right? If you filter the two groups differently, this doesn't that introduce some sort of possible bias that may increase your so-called, I mean, in this case, it does increase accuracy, but it might also, uh, it's it's something to think about. I don't know. I found that it's filled, it felt a bit like a little cheat. On the other yeah. hand, <laughs> right? I, I use this, I use this uh, particular filter by with the design matrix. It specifically chooses the smallest group to base how many genes it's going to filter. So it's technically good if you have uneven. That's where you're going to see the biggest difference. If you have uneven sample sizes, which we know, like a case and control, which we normally have. Uh, so instead of like treating it kind of like everything's equal, it'll say, oh, well, your smallest group only has um 30 individuals so we're going to use this 30 individuals to decide if we're if you see different variances versus oh we're going to just take pretty much we're just going to drop everything regardless i think it helps you see small differences uh that you might miss because you've got that unequal sample size so i do prefer to use the design matrix um, but I can see where you're like, oh, it feels cheating because you get that more, uh, uh, you get more out of it. Uh, yeah, I, I could see see that, but yeah, okay. So yeah, that's uh, interesting to consider the statistical implications, right? When you have this already biased view there, uh, that you get more data from one group, right? That's I think what's outcome here. As I said, yeah, there are more much more. It's, this is when when you add design there, you make it more permissive. You get more transcripts to the next steps. Um, now, for this one, if you the code is uh, there, so if you want to actually add your own method and try other methods, because there are still like the new edge arm. Uh, I think it would be interesting to to test with the using variance the variance matrix there. Um, to see if it changes anything. Um, so I made this uh, little um, little uh, GitHub repository with some instructions how to add your own functions to the to the code. There and the the RSC I already built the RSC with the yeah the transcription the salmon uh, quantification data. Now, now the problem is, of course, I guess you expected that the, when you have simulating data sets, uh, you might, there is always a big caveat there in this discussion, a challenging, right? How do you properly simulate without introducing biases that, uh, you know, skewing the data like actually we, when we try to use, uh, Hedia use the Volcano plot, uh, 
to look at the what we get <laughs> from this data and uh, I don't know which one of them uh, I think Lima Lima trend or Lima Vum uh, you plot it here Lima trend. Lima trend right but and it's not related to the method the problem is there's a lot of look at this data right it's a lot of upregulated it's completely lopsided um, a lot of upregulated uh, genes uh, transcripts in condition B here there has only two conditions right so yeah. Uh, it's, it's not how it's supposed to be, but this is simulation data for you. I'm thinking that, yeah, we could probably, there's there's way to do it better, but looking at, the, there was such a huge difference between condition A and condition B, uh, transcript quantification data, huge variance in the condition B, and you see all this, basically they only, looks like they only added up regulation for a lot of transcripts in condition B. So I don't know, this, skew in the data this may definitely affect these benchmarks quite a bit so all, everything here yeah should be taken with a grain of salt right it's i was just wondering why is there what looks like a some kind of cutoff on the negative expression thing no because there are not so many like uh, <laughs> that's a thing it looks like a cutoff yeah, right just a very yeah. short cutoff. but it's not a cutoff no, right it's not a cutoff. It's <laughs> that's how it looks data. like yeah <laughs> So there is a little bit of orange. Yeah, there. There there is a bit, yeah. It's just so small. Yeah. Yeah. So I will take it from here because at first, yeah, we wanted to use this simulated data, but when we saw the volcano plot, of course, we can't use this data. And then if we can put next, so we use. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. We she's... use a uh, brain sick phase two, so liver published data set. And we look at the log TPM model, the trend, Lima trend, and then also uh, Lima Vo. And here, so we show like the volcano plot obtained when we do like a for change cutoff of 0.3 and the uh, uh, adjusted FGR of, uh, below 0.05. So we can see that when we actually, when we uh, add only trend equal to true, as uh, Joe explained, there is no much difference be between the locked PM and the trend model. But when uh, we add the erase weight, uh, we can see like uh, there's a change on the volcano plot. And then if we can put the next slide, and here we can compare also the locked PM model with the boom model. And here, so we use, uh, as Joe explained, the counts. And we can see uh, the differences on the volcano plot uh, on like brain sick uh, phase two uh, data set. So uh, after we yeah, are having a look at this uh, volcano plot, what we did, let me share the other slide. Uh, what we did is to take the top 1500 based on the adjusted p value from you know the Lima log TPM, Lima trend, and Lima boom. And we saw that they have from the uh, 1500 top significant transcripts shared between them 579 transcripts. And each one, you know, had, for example, for Lima log TPM 171 that were not shared, uh, for Lima trend uh, 502, and for a Lima room from 190. Oh, sorry, is that percentage the expected growth between the different uh different methods what we were expecting? 25 percentage? Uh actually it's the first time that uh, I we compare the these three methods together. Because normally uh, we use a Lima log TPM. That's the most uh, like uh, used method. But uh, when you use uh, here, we said Lima trend. It means that when we add the weights and the trend equal to true. But when uh, you like use only the trend, you know, it's like uh, equal to true. So there are no much differences between the log TPM and the Lima trend. But for the Lima Vum, since the method, you know, it's like even what uh, Joe explained, the script is different. So that's why you see like there is like more, you know, differences between uh, this Lima Vum and uh, Lima Log TPM. 
So oh, even sure. between two of these, uh, let's say, the letters, we have around 30 percentage of cross. Yeah, uh, so 25, yeah. yeah so if, I, if I close the two, five, close the 12, yeah. the other side is around 35. Really. And here you have also to take into account that we didn't take the whole data. We took only the top 1500, you know, significant trust. So it might you not know, change uh, if you take like the whole image you know, like that. And then, so uh, the other slide here. So as a conclusion, we're, we were really happy when we found, because actually the heart opinion first that Joe showed, it was like from six years ago, something like that. And then, so I think, yeah, it's like he uh, the opinion of Gordon changed a little bit after uh, 5.7 years ago. So he said that uh, despite their popularity, GPM values are really only for description purposes, well, he said, and are not uh, suitable for uh, differential expression analysis. But at the end, he said that uh, what many people do is a Lima trend analysis of log two GPM. I've never done that myself, but I can't think of anything better if you all have, uh, if all you have are CPM. So, and since uh, it added only like a trend to the log uh, GPM method doesn't change much. So at the end, you know, using the log, uh, uh, log to GPM, yeah, plus one or 0. 0.5. So it's a good method that, you know, uh, some yeah, might don't uh, like, um, advice, but that's the best method when you have only, you know, it's like GPM for your analysis. And uh, so here, uh, the resources of the GitHub, the presentation, and then the, the study of the GTU that uh, Geo used for his analysis and benchmarking. And at the end, we want to share that. So now it's our, 4.0 is here. It has been published uh, very recently. And uh, so the, now it's like HR uh, 4.0 supports a small towns and a larger data. And I think that's all. So if you have any question or any opinion to share about like the methods or even yeah, your opinion, if you try like one of these problems, yeah. Go ahead, and thank you very much. I was wondering that, uh, I mean, the, looking at this, I don't know, I didn't expect that. To, these actually look much more different than I expected, right? This Lima trend and... Yeah, because uh, at first, so when you use only trend equal to true, it's like, it's same as log GPM. That's what we, I showed you last time. So, but when you add the array's weight, so it changes the volcano plot changes. But I mean, these two look much closer <laughs> as opposed to these two. Uh, that, yeah, here that's you, what I'm, you I don't know. I mean, not much so, closer. They are weird. They are, this is wider the zoom. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I expected for me this this part here seems strange. This on the right side. It's also a bit. Well, this is just a like scaling up on the trend. Yeah. Now. Can I ask why do you think the trend model is better? What is the um the the sort of the comparison with quote unquote truth data that makes you think it's better? Sorry if I missed it. Yeah, no, it's yeah. not. Well, that first of all, yeah, that it's uh, yeah you. It's hard. Uh, we cannot release. Really that was mostly like the, you saw that mostly basing that on the opinion of an expert there yeah. that said that yeah use trend. That's the best thing you can do to salvage a to make the best of the bad situation, essentially. That's what this is just today. So use trend. And indeed, I mean, these plots actually show an interesting difference. We cannot say it's better. And are the plots here uh, on these benchmarks, they look so close. Uh, where were those actually? Yeah, it's, uh, it's this one. Like Lima, Log, TPM, and Trend. Oh, these two actually. That's yeah, the ugly yeah. ones. That... <laughs> but again, th there's also the problem with this data set. It's so skewed uh, that it's hard to trust compared to real data. Um, we definitely need better, better uh, data sets, simulated data. And that's been a problem for a while in RNA-seq. Um, this was the quick one for differential expression 
uh, testing, but uh, there must be a better ones. Yeah, actually, if you can go to the yeah. opinion, yeah, maybe. Which one? The one. The first one? <laughs> the yeah, harshest. the opinion of Gordon. So. Oh, this one. Everything, yeah, started with this when we, uh, like, uh, wanted to use TPM. So, and we saw, so that, yeah, it's like uh, Gordon says that uh, one could, um, actually, he doesn't advise uh, to use, you know, it's like the log TPM. And then he said that it's better if you use trend equal to true and using array weights to try to partially recover the library size. That's why it's not that we uh, say that trend is better, but mm -hmm. it's based on the opinion yeah, of the maintainer, of, yeah, like of the expert. Gia, does Salzburg agree, <laughs> or or Lior? Oh. Do they agree? <laughs> First of all, I, their group at uh, Salzburg, they don't do differential expression much there. They only started recently to double with DTU. And yeah, so they probably don't have a big opinion on that. But uh, yeah, Leo, I, I don't know uh, if, if as he, he could only speak for himself. I don't know exactly. We haven't used these other methods, mostly a Lima the Lima standard one no. was just because we had these RSCs in the past with only the TPM matrix. Thank you. Yeah, yeah actually also uh, uh, we didn't understand when we found this post why, you know, like they advise to use the trend equal to true and the array weights. So that was the question. Why uh, should yeah? It's like why we can't use the uh, log TPM like method. It might be a bit of bias here, right? He, he definitely proposed this lemma for a long time. How to use it uh, based on counts and I don't know. I guess this TPM shortcut was. I'm not sure if it was really benchmarked. Or, I don't know how this. Uh, yeah, it's for me it's still a mystery. How are these properly benchmarked? If you in, uh, in the absence of of ground truth, uh, it's hard to really tell. And simulation is always a compromise. So yeah, it's a... Uh... Yeah, and that's why uh, Joe did other work to see, if, for example, using trend is better since it was yeah, advised. And uh, we saw that, uh, yeah, on the simulated data, they look the same, they are close, you know, so it's... Yeah, that doesn't... At the end, yeah, we keep using the, the log CPM method. Since you know there's no much differences there. Of course, using here simulated data. 